gain more than 907,000 jobs since 2009, and the unemployment rate is at a record low of 4.1 percent. Yet, economic growth has been slowing, and there are many uncertainties for the coming year. For example, it is too early to predict the full impact of the coronavirus on consumption and production, both at home and abroad. And later this year, we will have a presidential election that will have far-reaching consequences for New York City's residents and our economy. As I've been saying for years, we have to be prepared for the possibility of a recession, and we have to continuously reevaluate how well we are serving New Yorkers and if we are delivering real results. Unlike previous years, this year's preliminary budget did not include many new initiatives, but the current financial plan does include several significant programs that were added since the budget was adopted last June. These include additional funding for the implementation of criminal justice reforms, pay parity for early childhood education workers, and fair funding of the city's contracts with its human services providers. These are important investments, and I will continue to monitor their implementation. But as we invest more in certain areas of the budget, we also have to identify more opportunities for savings. Now, let's turn to review the city's fiscal year 2021 preliminary budget and the financial plan. So this budget, as you know, is $95.3 billion. As required by law, I could tell you it is balanced as presented. And as always, the financial plan shows budget gaps in future years rising to $2.7 billion in fiscal year 2024. But if you adjust for the use of surpluses from prior years to balance the budget, you can see that these gaps actually start now. In 2020, there is currently a $1.5 billion gap between revenues and expenditures, and that grows to $2.7 billion next year. That means that as of now, we are spending more than we anticipate taking in. We usually make up the difference before the year's end. But one little warning sign is if we suddenly had a reversal of fortune, that would not leave us with much room to maneuver. I also want to take a look at the capital budget. As you know, every year the Department of City Planning and OMB produce a long-term capital strategy to meet the needs of the city over the coming decade. This year's updated 10-year strategy is now $125 billion. That's the largest components are $24 billion for education, $20 billion for environmental protection, and $19 billion for transportation and transit. Now, here's some good news. The city is demonstrating that it can handle this level of capital program. When we first released a report on this issue five years ago, we found that the city was actually using just half of available capital appropriations. Every year since, we've called on the administration to do better, and thanks to our efforts, we have finally seen major progress in the last two years. Check this out. I do want to applaud the city for achieving a rate of 77 percent of available capital funds actually committed in 2019. This is very, very important, and it makes a difference, and I want to give them great credit. Um, now, many of you know the city presented its preliminary budget before the governor released his executive budget. And unfortunately, this year's state budget continues what has become a very destructive pattern. For the past few years, the state has consistently pushed more and more costs onto local governments and especially onto New York City. Cost shifts and unfunded mandates over the last five years have added nearly $800 million to the city's 20. 21 budget. And this year, even greater threats loom. The state has proposed additional cost shifts for family homeless shelters, public assistance, and child welfare, and school aid that falls well short of what our students deserve. These cost shifts total $261 million this year alone. Of, of even greater concern is balancing the Medicaid budget on local government backs and at the expense of beneficiaries and our public hospitals. 
These proposals could cost us hundreds of millions of dollars more in next year's budget. But as I've said over and over, we must manage our budget for the long term, not just one year to the next. And I have said repeatedly that we need to build up our reserve cushion and we need a more rigorous review of agency spending. That's how we will protect our most vulnerable communities. We simply have not done enough to root out inefficiencies, redundancies, and waste. We have not done enough to prepare to weather a storm, something we could not even imagine. We have got to get our act together now. So as of January, the January plan, the city has identified more than $2 billion in savings over five years. But 90% of it will be used to fund new spending needs. As a result, precious few dollars will remain for building up our budget cushion. The current savings plan is simply not enough, and too little comes from reoccurring agency efficiency initiatives, as you can see here. Since 2014, my office has worked with OMB to refinance and save New York City over $2 billion. These actions will save $315 million this year and $271 million in 2021. Just want to point out why we have a controller's office and the work that we do with OMB. Savings from debt refinancings are important, but our good work in this area cannot take place of real agency savings, so I'm proud of the $2 billion in savings, but even that is not enough. Let me point this out to you in this slide. Year after year, I've pointed out that we just don't have enough of a cushion in the event of some unforeseen national disaster. Maybe it's an economic turndown. God forbid another attack. My office has determined that we need, we need a cushion equal to at least 12% of spending. Stay with me on this because I think this is significant. Unfortunately, this chart looks exactly like it did last year and the year before that and the year before that. No progress. And as it stands now, we are $2.9 billion below what it would take to get us to 12% by the start of fiscal year 2021. Now, the administration will tell you that they have the highest level of reserves ever. They tell you this all the time. And in absolute dollar terms, that's true. But in terms of reserves as a percentage of spending, it's not. And it's going down. Despite 10 straight years of economic expansion, we still have not reached even the bottom of the optimal range for reserves. We can and we must do more. This cannot keep going in this direction. Too much will come our way that we will not be able to accommodate if we don't tackle this, this issue now. So to help achieve more savings, two years ago we introduced the agency watch list. The watch list exists to highlight areas where we have substantially increased our spending, but we're simply not seeing the results. This year, we continue to include citywide homelessness services and the Department of Correction, which have previously appeared on this watch list. And this year, we are adding Thrive NYC. So let's begin. New York enacted historic criminal justice reforms last year. Under bail reform, far fewer people are entering jail, and Rikers Island is finally on a path to closure. But past reforms have not translated into a more humane and safer culture in our city jails. In fact, rates of violence continue to climb. During fiscal year 2019, the city spent about $337,000 per incarcerated uh, individuals. As the population continues to fall, the cost per inmate is likely to climb even higher if we don't move more aggressively to right-size our correction system. 
Thus far, in the month of February, the daily jail population has averaged roughly 5,500 people. That's down more than 30% from a year ago. It also means that now, now is the time to capitalize on the rapidly falling jail population, find the efficiencies we need, and free up city resources for other purposes. Since last summer, the city has closed two jail facilities and another closure is planned in March. This has, proposed, this has actually produced real savings. We should close additional facilities and redirect resources to programming and treatment that can help prevent incarceration, reduce violence within the jails, and help people succeed in their communities after they leave. We need to pay very close attention to the Department of Corrections. We can save money, help lives. We've got to focus this as the budget hearings begin. I want to talk about homelessness. The homeless crisis in our city is heartbreaking and frustrating. Spending on homelessness this year is projected to reach $3.3 billion. We're spending more than twice as much on homelessness as we did six years ago. But the shelter population remains high at nearly 60,000 people every night. $3.3 billion and the population has stagnated. Our overall shelter population is up by 17% since FY 2014, and the number of single adults in shelter is at a crisis point, having risen by nearly 70% during the same period. The city's current approach is fundamentally not working. Just last month, our office issued an audit of the city's $53 million home-based homelessness prevention program, which revealed weak oversight, poor management, and inadequate tracking. It is unacceptable to continue spending more than $3 billion a year and not make an impact on our homeless crisis. There is a real human cost to these failures. We have to do more for families living in crisis and for those who are living on the brink. Last October, you all know, my office released a report on the rising crisis of domestic violence survivors in the shelter. Domestic violence has become the leading reason families seek shelter. 41% of all shelter entrants, 41%. The problem has overwhelmed our DV shelter system and has now overwhelmed the regular shelter system. More and more DV survivors are housed in the costliest and least appropriate settings, commercial hotels, without adequate services and without adequate security and safety. This is simply outrageous. It's a genuine crisis that desperately needs to be addressed through better permanent housing options, adding DV shelter beds, ending the use of commercial hotels, and expanding access to mental health supports. This can be achieved because the money has been there being wasted every single budget. Uh, this year, the city is going to spend $120 million on street homeless outreach and services, a 19% increase in funding from last year, and nearly twice what we were spending five years ago. Yet, I don't get this. We still have 3,600 people sleeping on our streets on any given night, so we have got to look at this and see why this is happening. The increase in outreach is important, but at the end of the day, New Yorkers experiencing homelessness need access to services and they need a home. That's why last month in Washington Heights, I proposed a fundamental reset in New York City's failed approach to our affordability crisis, a plan to finally create the housing we need. And that is why we're calling for universal affordable housing. We need to make sure that Families living on less than $50,000 a year, over half of whom pay at least half their monthly income for rent. These are the families most at risk. They're the families we should be building housing for. We need to make sure that we have progress, but we have to align our housing needs with our homeless strategy. We cannot continue to operate in silos. That's what we've been doing. This year, We've added Thrive NYC to the watch list. And I do want to start by saying that I do give credit to the mayor and the first lady. 
for elevating the importance of mental health and raising awareness of the gaps in mental health services. The goal is noble and important. Providing comprehensive mental health care should be a critical priority for the city. But the nobility of the mission cannot be an excuse for a lack of transparency and accountability. Last May, my office released an analysis with three main conclusions. One, there is no clear rhyme or reason for why certain programs under Thrive exist, while other very similar programs do not, or for why programs are called Thrive one day, but are not the next. Two, Thrive lacks robust outcome measures. And three, Thrive fails to provide accurate and timely tracking and accounting for spending. While the Office of Thrive NYC has acknowledged these shortcomings, we still have not seen real change. Last June, Thrive published a list of outcome measures that they promised to begin reporting publicly by the end of last year. Nothing has been released. It should not take this long to produce metrics. The Office of Thrive NYC has also failed to regularly update the budget on its website, and it has yet to report actual spending numbers for fiscal year 2019. This is what you get when you navigate to the Thrive NYC budget page as of 10.30 this morning. This is the budget page. The current structure of Thrive can only be considered successful if it can prove its effectiveness. By its very nature, Thrive should have better data and more accountability. We should not have to fight every year to see the most basic data on outcomes and spending. If it cannot produce the data, then it's time for a different approach. It would be better to simply have the appropriate agency manage the programs that can prove their effectiveness. Let's get this right or let's change this. But this status quo is not acceptable. When we go to a budget page, we expect to see real results. We expect to see numbers. People expect my office to analyze those numbers. But you can't analyze what you can't see. And that's why Thrive has earned a spot on our watch list going forward. So let me wrap up. The message here is clear and it's, it's urgent. The economic growth we've relied on in recent years is slowing down, especially when we look ahead to 2021. The mayor's agency savings are a start, but we need to do a lot more. We cannot take these risks lightly. Uh, look, in one of Aesop's fables, the grasshopper spends all summer singing instead of storing up food. When the winter comes, he has stored no food to rely on, and he starves. If we fail to take prudent steps to shore up our economic reserves now, when an economic winter comes, our most vulnerable New Yorkers will pay the price. We can't allow that to happen, and I look forward to a collaborative process to ensure that there is equitable and sustainable budgets for all New Yorkers, and I really appreciate all of you coming here as we examine the preliminary budget. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take a few questions, and Preston is here with me and the budget staff, and I want to thank Preston and everybody from the budget staff, Tammy, and all, everybody who made this uh, happen. Thank you. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. I just want to say to you, but on
Well, I think by putting Thrive on the watch list today um, sends, I think, a strong signal from our office, one, that we demand the data um, because we want to have more transparency. Right now, Thrive is acting as an umbrella uh, to so many programs, and that umbrella is keeping away the transparency that is necessary to do program evaluation. My sense is that some programs are working, others could probably do better, but in order to measure success of a program that's costing the city $240 million a year, we definitely have to do better. Do you have any, could you be more specific on program that you see are working, not right working, and what that are working, and you feel that well, part, I mean, Preston makes a good point. I mean, to really do a deep dive, we need to have the data. We thought we negotiated that last time. We did not receive what was promised. We're going to continue. Obviously, we're pushing this today. Uh, you got to show us the numbers so we can evaluate whether the program is effective. And one more thing on this, um, jump on your previous question a little bit. Um, if you are, if you were to become mayor, um, what do you see? Would you keep this program as is, or would you make changes? You know, it's hard to, look, the goal is critical. Mental health services are needed on the streets of our city. They're needed within our homeless shelters, and they're needed in our schools. But if we're going to construct a program that really works, it cannot be a political program. It has to be a program that has real results and a way to measure effectiveness. And in an economy that is getting a lot tighter, every dollar is going to count. And I want to make sure that as controller, not as somebody running for office, but as controller, my job is to measure these programs, look at results, look at the numbers. And right now, we can't do that because they have failed to produce the numbers that are needed to make that evaluation. So we're getting back to that. We, 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 you still more than answer the question. Do you, do you, if you, in your administration, you've got an administration, do you see yourself keeping this program, or would you look for an alternative to deal with a mental health health issue affecting the city? I think this program, because of its lack of transparency, has raised concerns uh, with the public and with people in our office who look at these numbers. I would probably dismantle the program, keep the programs that work, work with city agencies, and also make sure that we redirect the programs that have failed to live up to its expectations. Could you go into what you mean by a political? Uh, is there a suspicion that some of these programs that aren't working were done for a political? When you don't, when you don't give, when you say you're going to give numbers and you don't give those numbers, that's very telling. This should not be a back and forth. And it's become more of a political conversation or a gotcha conversation rather than looking at numbers, looking at the metrics of programs to see if they're being effective. That's what this should be about. Now, I have said that there are great, there are good intentions at City Hall related to mental health initiatives, and I want to keep stressing that. But we're spending a lot of money on a lot of different programs some of these programs were in Thrive, now they're not in Thrive, some are new to Thrive, and the whole thing is becoming what I think, it, what is becoming something that does not appear to be managed well, and we have to look at those numbers. Have you run into this problem before where you've wanted information on programs from City Hall and they haven't been forthcoming? Yes. <laughs> you don't have enough time. <laughs> unusual then to, to keep these numbers. Well, we, look, my job is to continue to be an independent, forceful voice on, on these budget issues. We take this responsibility very seriously. We have looked at a number of agencies, wasteful spending at DOE, wasteful spending at NYCHA. You've all seen our audits over the years. I have to push in every way I can. The reason Thrive is being added to the watch list is because we have not seen the numbers that we were promised, and that causes real concern. Yeah. Do you think that the city has these metrics complete and they're just kind of holding on to them? I know that 
you know, with the city ferry specifically, they have the demographic data for at least like a year or two and just refused to give it and finally did and it showed the opposite of what they were saying. Do you think that they have these numbers and they're just sitting on them because they don't know how to frame them? I can't, I can't tell you for sure, but I can tell you that I am committed to getting to the bottom of this during this budget cycle. Can you go into any differences in the, the hit to the city's budget from outside sources, state, or federal, that differ from what the administration is estimating? Look, I think, I think they're at the high end of what the state impact would be. I think we're kind of in the middle I think we still have to see how the budget plays out in terms of, uh, in terms of Medicaid and other factors. There's always the X factor coming out of Washington, as you saw, uh, between the, the tussle between the president and the governor. We'll, we'll continue to update our numbers and our analysis as we get closer to testifying at the city council, which I do every year, and we will refresh our numbers if necessary. Um. I, I, I wasn't clear. In one of the slides here, you separate uh, similar programs in and out of the drive. Uh, and one of the programs not in drive is the new family home visit. Um, and that's gotten, that's gotten some attention um, because it's a huge, it's a huge program launched in, in Brooklyn and um, it's um, giving some public attention to Charlene Cray as, as she mulls around her office over there. Did you have any concern about that program and, and do you know why it's not under the Thrive banner? See, it seems to me not to be in Thrive and a separate initiative, so we don't think it's part of the quote-unquote Thrive umbrella. Right. Why, why did you, uh, what, what was the point in separating out um, these, these two buckets? I think part of the, the issue here is that the, there are lots of mental health programs, some of which look very similar. Some of them are called Thrive, some of them aren't. I, you know, I don't think we could tell you exactly why that particular program that was announced recently isn't part of Thrive uh, when there's a similar program that is. I, I mean, that's part of the issue here is a sort of lack of clarity of the rationale why one program is a Thrive program and one is not. All right, thank you. Do you have a different estimate of the Medicaid impact than the city? Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's still a fair amount of uncertainty, um, and we've been talking to various parties about their interpretations and their estimates. Um, so I don't, we're still talking. I don't know, I have a firm estimate yet. I think the administration is so that, so the, the, taking a kind of maximalist view. They may be right but we know, we're still looking at it. They, they take the max view of a billion, but the window could be hundreds of millions to a billion. We just don't know. On uh, VOC, the, the jail population has been effectively cut in half. Um, what, what needs to happen with the number of um, guards that are working on it? We're, we're getting at two to one. Do, do we need to have a similar reduction in staff? Look, I, I think, I'm not going to be held to what reduction number should be, but clearly that is a, that's, a, that's a fair question. We're going to have to rethink uh, how we keep our system safer and where guards can better be deployed. And that's, a, that's something that I, I, you know, as the population falls, you're certainly not going to need that ratio uh, to guards. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.